On this week's edition of Connecticut Naturalist, wild turkeys are active in the fields. We take a look at a menagerie of mushrooms in the forest. Don't let these Indian pipes fool you. They're not fungi, they're plants. The milkweed pods have gone to seed. We've got an interview with Dr. Dye of the Western Connecticut State University Biology Department. Red spotted newts scal a dam on their journey to Revolution Pond. And we have a fascinating debate over the future of leap year. All this and more on this week's edition of Connecticut Naturalist. And now here's your host. Hello friends, I'm Will Michael and you're watching the Connecticut Naturalist. We find ourselves again in the winter, making this the most difficult time of year to film animal activity. I'm going to set up a filming station over here. While I'm doing so, here's some unreleased footage from last fall. The wild turkey was seldom found in Connecticut for several years. They were reintroduced to our forests and now are thriving. We are on a plot of farmland in New Milford, Connecticut, and thousands of pumpkins were grown in this field. This is the place where the 535 pumpkins were gathered and featured on the Halloween special. This group of turkeys is sweeping through the field, dining on seeds, from the grasses growing around the leftover pumpkins. Notice how the male turkeys keep a close eye on my activity. The males are larger than the females and have more elaborate plumage. The females are more camouflaged, specialized for sitting on nests made on the ground. A turkey is a large bird, so camouflage is important. However, if a predator were in pursuit, Wild turkeys can fly over short distances and up into trees. Domestic turkeys don't fly because farmers clip their wing feathers to prevent them from escaping. A little known fact about wild turkeys is that they are highly intelligent birds. Benjamin Franklin lobbied to have the wild turkey as our country's national bird. Sadly, he was outvoted and the honor was given to the bald eagle. The turkeys retreat into the safety of a cornfield on the other side of this stone wall. Hopefully, this spring, we'll be able to document mother turkeys with their young. Turkey Jones, Plymouth was your peaceful home. Then upon a dreadful day, pilgrims came to took you away. To a feast, they wanted to ingest your meat. You were trained how to... I'm in the process of setting up a camouflage filming station. I'll set up my pup tent and wait inside with my camera. This is a blind that hunters commonly use, but I use it for videography. It's compact and lightweight, making it easy to carry through the forest and quick to open up. While I'm setting up, here's some music and footage of a variety of mushrooms I filmed during the course of this year.
It's difficult for me to identify the names of each mushroom species. I've got to do my homework. But in our next segment, you'll see something that looks like a fungus, but is actually a plant. The Indian pipe is one of the most unique plants found in Connecticut. At first glance, this plant appears to look like a member of the fungi family. After all, plants are supposed to be green, right? Well, in the world of nature, there is always an exception to the rule. The Indian pipe is a non-photosynthetic plant, meaning it is a, quote, green plant that lacks chlorophyll and does not photosynthesize. You may be wondering, how then does this plant get energy? Here's the answer. Each flower of the Indian pipe contains seeds, as do all other plants. The seeds of the Indian pipe have stored energy inside of them. When the seed sprouts, there is just enough nutrients in the surrounding seed cap that the plant can grow to a small height and produce new seeds. This cycle is repeated. We still have a lot more to come on this week's episode. Stay tuned and we'll be right back after this brief message. Do you have a grub infestation on your property or in your garden? Do you feel there's no one you can call to for help? Well, now you have someone you can count on to remove all those garden dwelling pests. Meet the Flash. Who is this grub devouring speed demon? Why it's your friendly neighborhood frog of course. Call today for a free inspection. And for those heavy duty jobs, when unwanted pests invade your home and make you feel poor in spirit, we'll bring in Leonard the Toad. Our frogs and toads go through a six week training course and are legally licensed for insect termination. In this file footage, we see our employee of the month, Mr. Leonard Toad, taking out a dangerous super grub. On the first impact, the grub reacts aggressively. The grub is coming in for an attack, but you can rest assured that he's no match for Leonard. Using his secondary plan of attack, Leonard successfully removes the grub. Now all those garden plants and flowers can rest easier. So call today. We'll connect you with highly qualified agents in your area who will get the job done right for you and yours. Mention the Mad Frogger and you'll receive a 15% discount. What are you waiting for? Call today. Still no sign of any animal activity out here. Maybe it's because I'm making so much noise talking. Here's a look at the stages of development of the milkweed plant. We'll trace the history of the milkweed plant from summer all the way to fall. Back in the summer, it all started with the buds of the milkweed plant. On this hot night in July, the buds are open and pink flowers are in bloom. They attract moths and other nocturnal insects, as well as diurnal insects in the daylight. The insects pollinate the flowers, and later in August, large pods form where the flowers used to be. These pods contain a white sticky substance resembling milk. That's why they're called milkweed. The milkweed is a toxic plant, and most insects and birds do not consume the milkweed. But one exception is the monarch butterfly caterpillar. The monarch caterpillar eats the plant and is immune to its poison. The poison is absorbed into the body of the insect, making the monarch caterpillar a butterfly toxic to birds. When October arrives, all that is left on the milkweed are the seeds inside the pods. The pods split open and the seeds are dispersed by the wind. Last week, I scheduled an interview with Dr. Frank Dye of the Western Connecticut State University Biology Department. Dr. Dye is the founder of the Westside Nature Preserve. Uh, my name is Frank Dye. I'm professor of biology here at Western Connecticut State University. I've been teaching here since Johnson was president. That's Lyndon Johnson, not Andrew. Uh, actually, since 1967. 
Um, as far as a typical day is concerned, there is no such thing as a typical day. Uh, all five days of the week, the work week, are different, and they differ from semester to semester. But generally, I get here quite early because I'm a morning person. Uh, on a given day, I may have a lecture or two, uh, and a lab, and a staff meeting. Uh, other days might be quite light in comparison. Uh, I feel strongly that once the academic year begins, it's a seven-day-a-week job, and that's literally true. Uh, teaching requires a great deal of energy and time. Uh, if you're doing the job right, that's the kind of commitment one has to make. My major areas of interest outside of uh, WestCon are photography uh, and books. Um, biology is a very image-based discipline, and there's a certain aesthetic to uh, the biological world that appeals to me. So I enjoy spending a lot of time doing photography, wildlife photography, mostly plants, actually. And I'm interested in the history of science, so I'm always in used bookstores looking for significant books about the history, especially of biology. The uh, property of the West Side campus has uh, been under Westcon's uh, ownership uh, going back now almost 40 years. And I had the idea early on that uh, it would be appropriate before we developed to a great an extent to have a certain amount of property set aside as a nature preserve. So I spoke to uh, Steve Feldman, who was president at that time, and managed to garner his support. And uh, under Steve's administration, we had the first seven and a half acres surveyed. Um, we got it through the Board of Trustees. And then when Jim Roach became president, he continued to support uh, the Nature Preserve. Uh, many things in life require someone to carry the ball. And there are many things done by many people on this campus because an individual decided to carry the ball. Uh, for example, Paul Hines in chemistry is really responsible for the pre-med committee. Um, and I'd like to think that I'm primarily responsible for the uh, West Side Nature Preserve being here. And I have great hopes that it will, conti will continue into the foreseeable future. There are now two trails on the Nature Preserve. Uh, there are a couple of brochure boxes out there with self-directed guided tours and we have 20 numbered stations to which people can walk and on these little um, self-guided tours we have descriptions of what they'll find at each numbered station. Uh, the wildlife out there is uh, fairly impressive. Uh, there are plenty of deer all the time. Uh, the turkey population has become enormous. Uh, all kinds of birds to be found out there. Uh, part of the preserve is a, a grassland with a lot of brambles um, and surrounding trees, which makes it perfect for bird uh, habitats. And there are plenty of songbirds out there. We occasionally see red-tailed hawks, ospreys, and bald eagles flying overhead. And recently I was delighted to find uh, pileated woodpeckers uh, out on the West Side Nature Preserve. One of my particular uh, animals of interest is the amphibian, and uh, there are three main uh, amphibians found out there in terms of numbers. And those are the spotted salamander, Ambystema maculatum, uh, the wood frog, Rana sylvatica, and the spring peeper, Hyla crucifer. And uh, all three of those uh, breed in vernal pools on the west side campus. There are other amphibians as well, but those are the three major ones. Um, some people think you have to go to the Amazon Basin in order to see interesting wildlife, but that's, um, that's not true. Uh, some of the things that you can find in your own backyard are quite remarkable. I haven't had much luck today outside in the cold. I've got to pack up and get ready for an appointment. Let's take a look at some red eft activity from last year. This footage was televised on an earlier episode when I was still using analog editing equipment. Now it has been digitally edited to provide a clear picture consistent with the rest of this program. This dam is blocking the spotted newt's path to Revolution Pond. I don't know why they don't just walk around the dam, but anyway, it makes for fantastic footage. It's fascinating to observe these tiny amphibians crawling up this 90 degree stone wall dam. The wall is about eight and a half feet high, and the efts are only two to three inches in length. They have one tough climb. Sometimes the falling water sweeps them away or knocks them off the wall and they have to start over again. 
The juvenile stage of the red-spotted newt is referred to as the red eft stage. The eft has bright orange skin and a row of even brighter orange spots on each side of the back. The eft lives on land and is common throughout Connecticut. As the eft matures, its body changes. It loses the bright orange skin tone and turns a sort of olive green. However, the bright orange spots are retained. The tail widens, improving swimming capability. The mature eft is now referred to as the red spotted newt and lives an aquatic life. Again, there are always exceptions to the rule. In certain areas near the coast of Connecticut, terrestrial or aquatic dwelling may be omitted if the environment is too harsh for one or the other. This amphibian is one of the most common in our area. They are sometimes a nuisance to other species of salamanders because their population can overwhelm ponds or vernal pools. They eat other amphibian eggs as well. I'm now filming down from up on top of the dam. This illustrates just how steep of a climb these tiny creatures have. The stones are slippery. The efts and newts use every muscle in their body to maneuver their way up the mossy, muddy stones of the dam. When they finally reach the top, they run across the dam into the water of beautiful Revolution Pond. In case you're wondering, this pond was named by local naturalist George Earhart. You may remember that 2004 was a leap year, but what exactly is leap year? In America today, there's a growing number of people who want to have it abolished and institute a new calendar system. Here's a special report I conducted two weeks ago regarding leap year. Hello friends, I'm Will Michael reporting from Hudson Street in Bethel, Connecticut, where the topic of leap year has this neighborhood divided. In America today, there's a growing number of people who want to abolish leap year and institute a new calendar system to account for those lost hours that leap year compensates for. This quiet suburban neighborhood is split over the decision about leap year. Today we'll talk with abolitionists and advocates on the topic of leap year and hopefully shed some light on this issue. Here's a brief lesson on what leap year is. It takes the earth 365.24219 days to revolve completely around the Sun. Even this number changes as planets influence the Earth's movement in space over time. The point two four two one nine works out to be 5 hours, 48 minutes, and 46 seconds a year extra that the Earth takes to complete its orbit. Leap year usually comes every four years. But there are occasions when the interval between leap years is 8. This all has to do with complex astronomical measurements. But leap year has several social ramifications as we are about to explore. As we interview our guests, keep these facts in mind. If we could clarify the situation so that the, at least the seniors could, uh, it would be something that they could cope with. Uh, if you start to think about it, uh, you get very embroiled in something you really can't handle. Simplify it. Simpler system. I mean, the whole thing is, is, is so convoluted. Um, the point is that um, the, the government's been monkeying around with our calendar for, for, for years. 
if you expire uh, a day before the end of leap year, you'll have you have lost that day that you could have enjoyed immensely in these days of TV and, and electronic life. People are living to be so much older now. I mean, with medical technology the way it is, I say get over it. If you were to start, you know, at the beginning with uh, society, there would probably be a very easy thing to implement and do it properly. But since it's already embedded in our society, not only for financial institutions, but um, travel, um, finances, uh, it's, it's too well embedded in our systems to start beginning to change. We've opened the Pandora's box. It was opened when we first started using physical labor. Now when you have to compensate for physical labor, you need a, a mechanism in place that will give you an hourly wage. Now you take that to the next step, now you have to have a calendar. The only thing I see is leap year is a corporate conspiracy. 365 days a year, that's what the working man should work. What's this 366 days on the leap year? It's too much. Because it's so entrenched in our society um, that it would probably be a financial burden for the United States to try to change, just like uh, the uh, metric system was trying to be introduced uh, some years ago and failed. I think this is a corporate conspiracy just to get one more day out of the working man, out of the hard working man, not this corporate white collar stuff. Suppose uh, in a small town uh, we have a select man or a select woman in charge of the city and we're not happy and here these people have got an additional 24 hours on the job. There are a lot of people who will be affected by this change, not to mention daytime TV viewers such as myself. I mean, there's the People's Court, there's Judge Judy. TV Land, when they have the Mr. Ed Marathon, are they supposed to tack on two or three extra minutes every hour when they're trying to present programming? I think not. It takes someone of, uh, <clears throat> I guess, complex math abilities to straighten that out. The seniors, uh, they are confused enough about what's going on, trying to cope with life. It's very stressful. Uh, I never knew anything about the uh, adjustments made for a leap year. We should just keep everything the way it is. There's a conflict between the calendar an hourly wage and increments of minutes and hours and the actual solar and lunar timetable. I think it is unfair that there are people who are trying to to change it. What about Sadie Hawkins dances where you know on the leap year the girl is supposed to invite the boy to the dance. What would happen to that tradition? The most overly looked minority group in the United States are those people whose birthdays are on leap year. Like myself, I was born on leap year, and I find it truly unfair here in the United States, the land of equal opportunity, that I only get a birthday once every four years. I think it's time for a real change. person that's born on leap year, he doesn't know if he's uh, five years old or is he 20 years old. To those people who were born on February 29th, whatever that means, um, I just want to say I can feel their pain. I can testify to that. My birthday used to be February 22nd, and when they changed President's Day, my birthday is now the third Monday in February. How do you think that affected me? As we're investigating the issue of leap year, we're finding that there's so many other issues involved. Economics, birth, death, insurance, you name it, the list goes on and on. Although I accept leap year for what it is, uh, there are other options that can be had. Uh, a leap month. Once every 40 years, we take a whole month off and we go to the beach. Leap year is leap year. It exists. It's there. Don't monkey around with it. In daylight savings time, if we arbitrarily set clocks forward and backward to suit ourselves with the sunlight and, uh, and we can maybe take, instead of setting it ahead an hour, we set it ahead a half hour. I absolutely do not agree with this movement to get rid of leap year. This argument is anything but a dead end. It appears it won't be resolved anytime soon. Leap year is deeply entrenched in our modern day society and change always encounters resistance. If you'd like more information on the growing movement to abolish leap year, 
please feel free to contact me at the email address on the bottom of your screen. Well, friends, we've come to the end of this week's episode. I'm Will Michael, and you've been watching The Connecticut Naturalist. Stay tuned in weeks to come as we continue to document winter wildlife in our Connecticut forests. Here comes another animal music video, and I'll see you soon. When I fly, I never flap my wings, I just soar. I am Vic the Vulture, I am a connoisseur, some like older Thank you.